ready to start whenever you guys are. Hello, oh, yeah. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the trek. So this is going to be a little bit different than our normal treks. Um, Josiah has presented an issue in the community, and so he's going to give context to it. He's prepared some discussion questions, but we can, you know, use whatever uh, questions we want um, and see where the conversation goes. And as opposed to this conversation being theoretical, like normal treks, we're going to focus specifically on application and what we can do differently as individuals and or community after this. So Josiah, go ahead and take it away. About six weeks, six weeks ago, I was adding to, hold on one second, sorry, I gotta start. About six weeks ago, I was adding to an Instagram group chat made up of around 120 members of the 21 fellowship. After checking the group chat and participating in conversation over the next few days, it became apparent that the political views of the aggregate were very one-sided. I would describe myself as a populist right-leaning libertarian, but after a heated debate about the limits of free speech, I was treated like a radical. The consensus in the chat was that the government had the obligation to limit the First Amendment rights of others if they are deemed as quote unquote hate speech or quote unquote triggering. After using a hypothetical analogy about math to illustrate how risky letting the government censor free speech can be, I was removed from the chat. No warning, just removal. I didn't cuss or use homophobic, racist, sexist, or xenophobic language. The only thing I was guilty of was swimming upstream. Now that you've heard a brief summary, I want to pose these three questions. The first question being, removing someone from public discourse only alienates them further, resulting in radicalization. How can we as a community ensure that we're not alienating those who fundamentally disagree with us? Also, if you all have any more questions about um, like the actual incident before we get into the questions, um, go ahead. Um, so related to Josiah's first question, um, um, I'll pause the question. What are our current ways of dialoguing about difference right now? Are they sufficient? Well, I think as seen here, they're not. I mean, considering they just kicked Josiah out of the group chat, like, there is no dialogue. Um, I mean, how do you dialogue with someone if they're no longer in, like, at the table or even in, yeah, like, you can't dialogue with someone unless, like, they're there. Precisely. Wait, Josiah, I'm so sorry to hear that this happened to you. This is so, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, wait, so were they engaging with your points at all? Like, was there any actual intellectual clash happening? I sent 11 screenshots to the uh, um, to the team at CU. Um, they were mostly focusing on things that weren't necessarily related, but were somewhat in the conversation. Like, for instance, there was one member of the group chat that had used an example of how sexual assault can be triggering. And I understand how that's a very serious problem and can bring about a lot of emotional harm. But then what I did is I used an example about math. Um, basically, what I had said was um, if someone uh, was talking about a certain math concept that they didn't understand and that caused them to get a bad grade in a class that they used to take and they were really really angry about getting a bad grade because they were very serious about their GPA um, would that be considered triggering to them because they're very very angry about this old grade that they got and they still can't get over it would that be considered triggering of course that would be a more surface level issue than something as serious as sexual assault but then what happened was I was using that as an example to how the government cannot censor or legislate free speech entirely. And that was my point of view. And of course, there's plenty of room for disagreement on that subject, but they weren't engaging the idea of the slippery slope that comes with the government legislating free speech. What happened, the last chat I saw was, quote unquote, imagine comparing sexual assault to math. And then I was kicked. No no uh, warning, no forewarning of any kind. I was just removed. I had to have an, one another friend um, yeah. from the from the group chat take screenshots for me. Yeah, what 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 this situation really reminded me was that. Well, I mean, the, there there are so many things that 
citizens, just people need to learn in order to be like, to, to actually be constructive for a democracy. Like look, understanding like, re understanding rhetoric and logical fallacies and um, like, how it, it's like it's like a common tactic used by like political operatives to to bash people for the analogies that they draw obviously you can draw some, some bad analogies or like uh but i i mean i i guess i've just seen i've seen that tactic used so much to just disengage from the arguments um and i just i don't see a way around us people just people people stooping to that argument without us talking about argumentation itself, right? Teaching people about that, teaching people about logic and, and also getting people to agree that it's important to, to argue well, right? And to actually understand that it's, it's important for sense making to actually be able to hold space of disagreement or, and, 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 and work towards understanding even if not agreement okay so um chabu and allison i know that you haven't like weighed in and if you're not like comfortable right now or whatever and you're like still like making things or whatever um that's okay uh but just wanted to give you the floor if you want to yeah i've had my hand raised because i wanted to say something I was unfortunate. I was part of the group chat that Josiah was talking about. So this is definitely uh, a bit of a hard conversation because the thing is, I mentioned how a friend of mine made a don't drop the soap joke in a group chat that I was in, and it made me uncomfortable being that I'm an essay survivor. And Then I remember Josiah making a comment about how some drop the soap jokes can be funny. And I was mildly offended by that because I was like, you. Yeah, I agree that I was the one who removed you, but. I said that I'm a sexual assault survivor. I don't personally find those kind of jokes funny. And you tried to defend it. And so I was like, excuse me? Because. And the issue with your analogy about math is that the connotation of the word triggering, it literally means it get, it brings you mental distress. Like if you even think about it, you're prone to panic attacks, breaking down, et cetera. And so I felt like the analogy was very poor. And so like comparing getting a bad grade in math to sexual assault, like I just don't feel it triggers the same levels of distress. It doesn't trigger the same levels of wanting to avoid the topic. Like, yeah, for a little while, you may want to feel like you didn't um, want to go to math class, but I wouldn't say it to the point where every single time you pass by math class, you get flashback to the event and you feel like you're reliving it and it's just, I felt oh. like you were trying to take a loaded term and oversimplify it. Oh yeah, no, that's 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 a hundred percent exactly what I was trying to do. Math is nowhere near as important as sexual assault, but one could claim it was. That was my point: is that you guys weren't giving me an objective definition of what could be considered uh, triggering, and there's an infinite amount of subjectivity that could be that could be like um, injected into the term triggering. That was my point exactly. And as for the drop the soap joke, I never sent a drop the soap joke at all to the group chat. I didn't start that conversation at all. You had made a comment about it. And all I had said was any joke when given good timing, good delivery can be considered funny to any sort of audience, depending on the audience. That's all I said. And then we got in a debate about comedians and I have screenshots that I've sent to the CU team about this. And then it delved into free speech from the comedian arguments. And so my point was entirely that um, it is a slippery slope to let the government control free speech and no one debated the merits of that idea. No one made any argument for it. All you guys did was attack the analogy that I made. And first off, I may have like kind of given poor wording to what I said here because I don't have it in front of me. 
But when I, when I texted it, it was very, very clear what I was trying to do. It was, I mean, it was abundantly clear the point I was trying to make that one could claim that anything um, and any subject could be quote unquote triggering to them because there was no set definition. There was no source posted in the group chat of this is the official definition. There was nothing. So I just want to jump in here and like almost like clarify the objective of this conversation. One, I don't think it'd be appropriate to sit here and tear apart the schematics of whether or not it's okay to discuss like serious issues, especially in the context of sexual assault. Like that is an issue separate of its own. I think the topic of that conversation is a nuanced issue, but the challenge that, and correct me if I'm wrong, Josiah, the challenge you would like to address is like feeling polarized by the way that your disagreement was handled. And I feel like we should stick to that if that's what the case is, because how the conversation was conducted and how exclusionary that might have been is very, very, very separate from a conversation about things like how do you conduct yourself around triggering topics and like appropriate commentary in regards to that. So I just want to steer the conversation in that direction, if that's what we're trying to do here. Yeah, so I think that this would be a good time to turn to the first question that Josiah had posed. Um, so I'll go ahead and paste it in the chat. And it's, how can we, as a community, ensure that we're not alienating those who fundamentally disagree with us? So feel free to take that away. Um, I can jump in and say that um, I feel like we're just um, being placed in a very weird spot when it comes to political discussions because for a lot of people, their life experiences are made political. Um, and so there's that attachment there that is very, and it's very difficult to compartmentalize your emotions from like your lo the, log the logical man, right? Um, so I think entering the conversation with that fundamental understanding will help even the playing field for even the playing field even just slightly for everyone involved in this in the discussion um yeah i there needs to be some base level of empathy from both sides and i completely understand where everyone is coming from um yeah for sure, just, yeah. Yeah, adding on to that, I mean, I think there's a need for unbiased facilitators um, and people who can hold space for people on both sides and acknowledge like emotion um, that people are experiencing. Um, but, you know, like people who maybe aren't there to take a stance, but are rather there to hold the safe space for people. Yes, and I love what you all said there, Angel, about, you know, like, uh, like a baseline empathy for both sides and Ashley what you said about the facilitator. Um, I think the stance that we've taken previously in the CU community is that like, we are like, we do civics, but we don't necessarily have political conversations. But obviously, by nature of our organization, the members are going to be interested in political conversations. And so the default is going to be the conversations that are happening outside of this space and people are going to default to those norms and so we need to hold space here when people can like I, I, i'm thinking of even like potential events or whatever where we kind of like practice healthy conversations because if we don't like learn how to do it together how can we expect people to model it you know within the community be it in the slack or like an instagram dm um so i think that that's that's a direction that we could explore and also just like an act of design choice that needs to be made by all participants is whether or not this is the right space or context for this to happen. There's something like highly informal and like there's no structure and like there's almost like a completely different mind frame that you adopt and you're having a conversation over DM rather than like having a conversation in a track. There's things that you take into consideration automatically and like practices that leave at the door in a DM conversation. So I think it's also important to be cognizant of, is this a topic that can be discussed in this setting? Um, especially if the topic's like really, really important and personal, then that's a choice that needs to be made as well. 
Yeah, well said, Chabu. Um, I mean, I've uh, I've said this to more than just Josiah. <laughs> Slack chat is not, or uh, Instagram private group is not the place to have um, triggering discussions, right? Or political, like ser like seriously argumentative discussions. Um, no, it kills the vibe for everyone. Also, you're not going to get anywhere with it, right? Because, like. <laughs> Just think about it. Like when you're in the in the heat of a Slack debate, um, you're just like stewing. You're waiting for the other person to reply, and you're like cracking your fingers. Okay, I'm gonna type up the best response, and I'm gonna own them, right? Versus like even with a track or with audio, um, you 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 have you inherently are are have more empathy, right? Because you're 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 feeling the more holistic version of the other other person right and you're um also well that gets me to the other point where we need to actually find a way to go from that slack chat if there's like a signal that we want to discuss it to a place of healthy like discourse that allows for disagreement right right now we don't have that we don't have that protocol that allows for hey it's like there's some kind of like way that Josiah or whoever else can signal, oh, this is, here, here's an opportunity for us to, to transition at some point to a, um, a kind of venue of sorts where we can have a much healthier version of this dialogue that we, that we might have a unhealthy version of in the Slack chat. Yeah, I'm definitely more than guilty of that. I, I, I've had more than my fair share of uh, Slack debates, and I also agree that there needs to be some sort of venue where it can be dealt with, like Trex, similar to Trex, in a healthy manner. And honestly, the thing about the Instagram uh, group chat was that there were already very heated uh, debates going on before I had ever joined. I looked at past chat before I was added in there because I wasn't the one who created it, and I wasn't there when it was created. Um, when I joined, there was already like 110 or 115 members. And um, another thing would be, it was, it already seemed very, very open to heated debate. So I didn't feel out of place bringing up these topics or continuing on these topics. But I agree with what Gary said, there needs to be a place for it. I have a question that's more so directed towards you, Josiah, and then I'd like to open it up to the entire group. But what do you mean by like failure? Because I feel like that's a very important metric for us to work around. So when you ask the question, how do we have like political discourse without failing, like am I, someone who doesn't hold like the majority opinion, what do you, like, what does failure mean to you? Like how, what would adequate support look like? You're muted, Josiah. I'm sorry, failure. What exactly are you referencing? I'm referencing your original question. Hold on. I don't remember. I think it wasn't the exact language, but um, basically if, if the question was something like, how can we have healthy conversations without failing the people who disagree with us? So like what would yeah. it fail someone in that situation? Um, so my biggest issue with it was that I wasn't warned. So like they didn't say, um, the, there was no warning or anything that I was going to be removed. I didn't know people were ever removed from that. I might've been the first, I'm not sure. And there was no clear rules on the Instagram chat as well. No one had laid out. When you have a, a, a group chat that has 120 people in it, um, generally, you know, there, there needs to be some sort of guideline. Um, and I don't know if my number is completely right, but last time I checked it, it was like a three digit number around like 120 or something like that. And I, I had never been, you know, uh, reprimanded for anything in the past when I was in there for a few days. And I think that just generally setting guidelines and then providing warnings to people that are not following those guidelines is a great way to mandate a space that where healthy debates can be discussed. I just have a question though. How do you know like when you're debating something appropriate? Because there are arguments that unfortunately do invalidate other people's personal experiences. There are arguments 
that invalidate other people's struggles. And so it's just, in my opinion, it's a slippery slope. You can definitely debate me on that because I am not very versed in logical fallacies. But the thing is, how do you know you're having a healthy discussion versus a debate where you're straight up trying to invalidate someone else's experiences? You don't. I think that there has there there's like a difference between because what you're asking for is almost like guardrails or boundaries that are set within a given conversation before participating, right? But you can't rely on someone setting boundaries for you in every context. And like Instagram is a perfect example of that. Like no one is there to like police the situation and there are going to be fewer and fewer instances like as you get older where people will be there to police their, the situation so i think it might be more worthwhile to like almost have those boundaries as an, an internalized me metric um or only participate in those type of conversations where those boundaries are preset which they weren't in this case and that's almost like a good cue that that's not a conversation that should take place here because there aren't those like pre-disclosed universal boundaries here. Right, and I would almost turn that question around, right? I, like, I mean, I think um, there, like, there's only a certain degree to which we can um, police someone else's behavior and ask them to act in ways that make us feel, you know, safe. But I would almost ask, like, what, like, what, what power do we have to ensure that we are engaged because like I like I can't control what people like say what arguments they make but I can control what spaces I enter and what spaces I want to call my own right and so if I was part of like a situation where I did not feel safe I would maybe leave that conversation and leave that space um like I like like I don't know I just feel like it's so hard to um always I mean, like, yes, like, guardrails are awesome, but, like, I cannot make sure that Angel, like, only says things that I, like, right, like, I, like, like, I can't control what she does, and so, like, if, like, something happened that really didn't make me feel safe, I, like, I, like, I'd probably say, like, bye, y'all, like, I'm just gonna hop off this track, uh, because that's what I need, so, like, I, like, I guess I just almost feel like part of it is, like, being able to, like, say what you feel and say what you need, um, and just, like, take like take what you need from a space and like leave it if that's not what it's giving you yeah so oh just say you're muted no you can go first no go ahead i was about to transition us okay just one last thing yeah no i definitely understand what you're saying ashley how disengaging can be very very um effective if you're just not necessarily interested in like continuing that debate if it's not a healthy debate um and i know understand how guardrails can't exactly control everyone's uh you know actions and what they say but i guess the issue then delves into i, I neither allison didn't disengage or anyone else there was m other people there it's not just allison's fault or anything like that um but there was no disengagement of okay we're not going to continue this okay we should stop talking about this we should change the subject there was you have been removed from the chat i guess my question is like whose responsibility did you feel like it was to say or do that like who would have had ownership of that action ownership of disengaging yeah because this is like a very like tricky situation and I don't think either party is like quote unquote innocent, but there also needs to be like a role of like, this is what I could have done to like contribute to a better situation. And I wanna make sure that that's a part of this discourse as well. Yeah, I suppose whoever would disengage would be the one who deems the, quite, deems the conversation um, not appropriate or not worthwhile. Um, I didn't know that the, I, I didn't really see it, the debate as very heated until I was removed. And I was like, okay, they were taking this a lot more seriously than I was. Not that I was joking or that I didn't mean any of the rhetoric I did. You can see screenshots of what I said. 
and I meant every word that I was trying to make points of free speech, which I support. And I think that um, whoever believes that the conversation isn't worthwhile should be the one to initiate the disengagement. I didn't think, I thought we were getting somewhere and then I was just removed. Okay, um, now I'm going to pose Josiah's third question because it's related to like action steps and I want us to take some time now that we have some context about the situation, I've talked about it a little more in depth. Uh, so what processes can we experiment with to facilitate a positive change and political tolerance? Um, does anyone want to start us off? I know we've talked a little bit about it, but I'd love to go into more detail. I feel like before we dive into the answer of that question, it would be cool to just like, one of the objectives is like positive change in political, I mean, political tolerance in our community. But based on this conversation, are there other objectives we'd also like to tie in in addressing with experiments? Yeah, the protocol. The protocol for actually moving um, a identifying an opportunity to talk about something that make uh, people may disagree on, but that is important to people. Yeah. So for something like that. Um... I think it's it's harder to regulate individual action like when we're saying like an individual should disengage at this time like we can like recommend something like that but it's just it's so hard and i think that what that change would really come from is us doing something like like right now i'm envisioning like an event series similar to the trek that from when people like enter the CU community they participate in one and it like the culture of it becomes very clear and it translates to other conversations within the CU community yeah. and hopefully outside of the CU community. Yeah, um, and I know you said the word disengage, but like I'm, I'm like changing that paradigm. I, I'm, I'm thinking that like people don't, don't engage in a heated like text-based argument at all. Like and, and that that's like a that's just a practice, right? Um, and we can we can hear we can debate whether we want that or not. But I think that's an idea that we want to explore. That we don't debate heated things in text-based communication, and we like then anyone that wants to opt in to a voice video-based conversation can, right? And exactly what that format is. We'll want to iterate on that, just like we iterated on the trek. Um, but that's really exciting to me because, and then, and then the way that we would, once we're happy with that format, like a month or two from now, once we've like really iterated on it, then that's the official community guidelines. Um, and then anyone that has a heated debate, anyone that starts a heated debate and continues it, and like ruins the channel, like th that's the thing, right? Like Josiah and others, like when you take over the random channel with a heated debate, it ruins it for everyone, right? And I didn't, that didn't even really occur to me until like this conversation started today. Like, uh, I was like, oh yeah, like other people are discussing like lighthearted things in random. Like they don't wanna hear this debate, right? So how can we make this like an opt-in experience so that it's better for everyone that didn't wanna be part of it and better for the people that wanted to be part of it. And also just referencing like processes for opting in or opting out I think that it'd be like just a universally useful skill set to be able to determine like boundaries that you set for yourself and so like rather than like being reliant on a facilitator especially in like less structured situations like an Instagram DM or a class conversation or a candid conversation between friends and stuff like that um, I hope that like whatever process we come up with or experiment we come up with also helps people understand like these are the things that I just like won't discuss in this specific situation or like these are topics that are difficult to debate because of like the personal connection that I may have to someone or shouldn't be debated because of like the personal implications to that. Um, and also just to like summarize. So our experiment objectives are to identify a protocol for opportunities for political discourse and then increase political tolerance and then followed up with like personal boundary setting for individuals. 
Yeah. Sounds just, amazing. Just to make this as tangible as possible so we can, um, uh, you know, do this together. I created like a brainstorm doc. I'm going to screen share here. And I've listed a couple potential design choices here. So I'm thinking like it should be recorded like this because I think it really makes you think about what you're saying if you know it's going to be recorded and anyone could go back and watch it. Um, I think there should be like a CU team member present, like probably Gary, just because if you know it's not just like, you know, like fellows there or other builders, it's like a good reminder that like, you know, anyone could be watching this. Uh, people from both sides, so like someone who, uh, it's not just like one against five or whatever, it, maybe it's like one person who feels really strongly, a couple people who feel really strongly, and people who are more like neutral or open to the other side and more I don't know and then like a neutral host like Ashley mentioned someone who's not participating in the dialogue but it's kind of like being like a facilitator and then no live viewers because if there's like live viewers I feel like people could like go in the chat and be like plus 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 and they would feel like they're like performing for an audience as opposed to like engaging in actual dialogue and I'm thinking around like six people would be a good number because you want to leave enough space for um people to talk but not like take up the entire space if that makes sense. So want to know what you all think about those and what else you're thinking as well for this. This is cool. This is uh this is the next step for our community or one of them. Any other thoughts regarding design choices? Um, I can say I, I really like the amount. This the, It's very close knit, um, very tight, very much. E it's easier to humanize the not the opponent. I don't want to say opponent um, because that's argumentative and defensive, but um, it's easier to humanize the person that you're engaging in conversation with. Um, and you brought up a really good point about the plus, plus, plus. I know sometimes it could be like encouraging, but especially when you're someone who's not necessarily are, um, who's not necessarily like spouting points from the less agreed upon side of the conversation. Um, it definitely makes you get a little bit more defensive. And I can only imagine how um, much more so in a group of 100 or 120 people, so. Yeah, I um, I agree with that. And something I also wondered too, I know a couple of people touched on this earlier, was like, how do we kind of like incorporate like more empathy into like the actual design of the conversation itself? And I wonder, and like, I mean, like things I've done in the past include things like, like listening and looping, where like you actually reflect back to someone what you heard and give them a chance to say, so yeah, so it's like Angel would tell me something, I could be like, what I heard you say was X, Y, and Z, and an Angel can be like, actually what I meant was blank, blank, and blank. Um, so, like, yes. that, so like that could be an option. Um, or like something that I've also done in the past is like, after you, like after someone says their point of view, like, and like the other person uses I statements uh, to like reflect back what they heard. And that's like a way to put yourself in someone else's shoes. I guess I just think about like those strategies as ways to like, you know, like go like go beyond like just like transactional understanding of someone and like kind of just go a bit deeper. I love that. Yeah, I think that there's a lot that we can steal from the Socratic dialogue format as well, because in the same way, the host is very neutral in the Socratic dialogue and they don't participate. Only thing is like, I wouldn't just limit it to like personal experiences. So I think that we can have a, a really good combination of uh, and, and take from what works best in a lot of different formats. Also, I'm wondering about like the idea of recording the conversations. Um, I'm not opposed to like note taking or some version of it, but if co-learning is our objective, like CU is a safe space to co-learn, but like the internet is not. <laughs> um, and so I just think that idea, like the found, like the entire premise of the fact that this is something that's going to be online. So if you're learning and like making- oh. That's like a lethal combination that kind of makes everything a mute point. I agree. And I think that like, if people want to speak from like personal experiences, um, like if it, it gets in a really touchy situation, like knowing that if you're recorded could actually change what you say. And I think that having a CU team member present fulfills the objective of like 
making people mindful of what they're saying like you know like gary's whatever like someone from the actual scene yeah. so i think that's a good call out Chabu. yeah um to the question in the chat does it have to be left a little youtube it doesn't it doesn't and i i, I don't know if I mean, I'm not saying that many people are watching the trek, but like we have some guests of the trek that that are like, uh, like from last week, they're like, when is it uploaded? When's it uploaded? I want to share with my with my Twitter followers, but like there, there's not really that utility, I would imagine, for something like this. So we can record it and just like not upload it, right? Just for, just so it's not like, if I'm the if I'm the by the neutral whatever, um, I'm not just like playing a game of telephone when explaining what happened um, and we have a record. That's also a good question. Do you think that, I mean, it's obviously very a very different design choice for facilitator being like a builder or fellow um, or like someone like Gary? What, what do you all think about that? I mean, I, I just, I think I think we'll need to have like a, some kind of training process for yeah. um, like it sounds like Ash I mean Ashley just kind of lived like 12 lives or something so I think that's why she, she like knows everything but um, so I mean I've been tech like literally as we were talking like I've been texting Nick ideas for like new series you know Nick has his Nick, Nick's new knowledge series that he launched like a few weeks ago and we're thinking about launching like a bunch of series right like and we could have one on like logic and rhetoric we could have one on um maybe part of that or something else or just a workshop on how to facilitate and maybe we can pull in zoe for that right um but i i think there's like there's gonna be a pattern of like name your competency that is required to play a particular role in the community and then name your training that you need to go through in order to earn the the kind of the credibility to to, to have that role right um and so until we have that i think it's probably better if a cut member is is the person there and also having it recorded just allows um everyone to like look back was the facilitator good in the first place um you know what I mean? Well, as as telemarketers like to say, uh, recorded for quality assurance. Huh. Okay, so recorded but not uploaded, basically, right? I think it would also be like great to have participation be open to almost anyone. So like it can be focused on fellows and builders, but I also think that this is a great opportunity to like really implement our like belief in intergenerational dialogue and pull in like the guidance and perspective of guides and like CU team members. Um, Cause it could very easily be a knowledge gap rather than a heated debate on an issue. And there needs to be a way to kind of circumvent that as well. Um, I would kind of like push back on that just because I think that when there's a guess and there's like that sort of gap and like the guess is supposed to be someone you respect it's a lot harder to disagree with what they say and so i think that i mean we know that the conversations are already happening between fellows and builders and that you know that's something that they're obviously comfortable with doing and and, and sharing uh you know you know sharing everything and so i think that it might compromise the quality if we try and like scale it to like be intergenerational. Well, I don't know what exactly, and Chabu, please clarify. But um, regard, regardless, what what you said reminded me of what happened with the Shrek. Right, we didn't open it up to guests until we got the format down. Right after like twelve times. Right, so maybe there's an opportunity for like let's say some framer that, you know, there's a disagreement between that framer, like a, like a friendly disagreement. I'm like, okay, what should, what should CU do uh, related to this focus area, right? There's plenty of the situations, right? Like I would love to pull Jeffrey in to, to like a, 
um, a forum where we talk about some aspect of the future of CU where, where, where we disagree on. But um, we, we can always just do that. We can do that more easily once we've gotten the format uh, kind of honed. Yeah, and, and another thing I just want to distinct, like this whole talking about guests or whatever makes me think about distinguishing between the trek. And I think that this conversation should not be like live note taking because if the whole point of this is we want to teach people, like if we, we want to feel the most like a real conversation as possible over Zoom, right? Like have people face to face talking and it's, it's hard to feel like you can translate like the whole vibe and I guess format into another space if it's like you're like live note taking on notion like that doesn't happen in real life so want to hear what you all think about that too yeah no I think that's like a really important thing to emulate here at the end of the day like there needs to be almost like a grounding objective and the grounding objective is the fact that like we're all people who are interested in like bettering our democracy and so like having to be face to face with people and like not distancing ourselves from that is super important and i feel like a design choice that could be helpful in that um verita has this practice of like turning off screen sharing whenever there's like a dialogue that's supposed to happening supposed to be happening um even if it's like a presentations involved so that way, like people are almost like forced to look at each other and nothing else. And so I feel like that's something we can do here. Sorry, what did you turn off what? So like turn off screen sharing. So like the only option is to like look at the people that are present. Uh, regarding the note taking, the, would the known li no live note taking, would that only pertain to the facilitator or would that pertain to people in the debate itself? So I'm just talking about how like normally in the track we do screen sharing and then the host is the one who's like note taking the points that everyone's taking like Josiah said this so it's just Josiah mm -hmm. what he said uh, we wouldn't be doing that in this because we would want it to be as much like a real conversation as possible like obviously in a, in a real conversation people aren't going to like whip out their laptop and be like Josiah said this Angel said this or whatever so oh uh, okay just okay. out of curiosity would the facilitator be note taking like not live. I mean, there's not like not screen sharing yet, but still be taking notes. I feel. Wait, uh, Ashley, you were posing a question, right, about that? Yeah. I can. Yeah. Okay. I didn't want to cut you off. Sorry. Um. Yeah, I feel like definitely the facilitator should be taking notes because if you look at presidential debates, Congress debates, and things like that, facilitators. I mean, this is my personal opinion. Facilitators are always. Uh, debate moderators are always taking notes and writing things down, and they have questions prepared for both sides. And if we knew ahead of time the subject of the uh, discussion, um, the facilitator would be able to uh, draw up uh, questions to pose to both sides. And then also the note taking helps them map what arguments are being made by both, by both sides of the discussion. And that'll help you better understand who is and isn't addressing the uh, other side's uh, point. See, I, I think this poses a larger question of what is the role of the facilitator and what you're talking about is a little bit different than I was envisioning. Um, I think like what I thought of note taking, the purpose of that would be was to just be like a keep a record of it. And if we're recording, then I don't think that would really be necessary. Um, so we'd love to just dive into a deeper conversation about, yeah, what you think the role of the facilitator would be. Would they be, I think a big one is like, would they be the ones asking the questions or would it kind of happen like how it happened today? Like we would start off with like maybe a couple questions and then people can take the conversation where they wanted to, similar to the trek in that nature. I think we also need to determine like, is the facilitator a participant? Like, like do they get to like steering? Okay, so if the answer is no, um, then it becomes a matter of like, how do we maintain, I'm trying to think. There's like a level of neutrality that I think that needs to be involved here. And so I think like their role is to intervene in points where it strays from like the conversation objective. So a, like a practice of this could be, the point is to understand or like reminisce over the competing perspective of X versus Z or like this specific challenge. And then when the conversation strays from that or the conversation strays from boundaries that we've set as a collective about like what's appropriate and what's not appropriate to be up for debate, quote unquote, in this conversation, that's the when, when the facilitator steps in. I feel like that would be a good role. Yeah, I think um, that... Go ahead. 
Sorry, go ahead. Oh, great. No, no, I, I was just saying I agree with that. I think, I think facilitators, um, like, essentially, like, they, like, they enable groups to work cooperatively and effectively, right? And so, like, I guess where I see them intervening is, like, you know, like, I mean, like, Trabu said, when, like, we aren't on a conversation anymore, or when, like, one person is clearly, like, dominating the conversation, like, like, I think the facilitator should be the person to, like, acknowledge that, and then, like, invite other people to contribute, or, like, they should, um, you know, like, they, like, they should kind of point out, like, if the whole group as a whole isn't, like, considering something, they should play devil's advocate. Like, I mean, I just feel like, like, people should own the conversation, but the facilitator is there to, like, provide the good rooms and to, like, help guide the conversation um, into, like, a place that is actually productive and not just, like, people, like, bickering over, like, the same points over and over. So do you think it would be constructive to in, entail time slots so that everyone gets to talk an equal amount of time and it's already pre-prepared? I mean, I feel like in some some essence, it would, I, I know a lot of people at CU prefer the Socratic free dialogue with no restraints, but at the same time, I think that time constraints also have some sort of positive effect when it comes to forcing someone to um, present their, almost like present their ideas to where others, they know they, their time's not going to be overrepresented and they're not going to be able to just drone on and on and on, right? Yeah, so a couple of things come to mind here. I think of a trek, how before every trek we set the norms and expectations where we're like, um, we're all about concise talking points because we want to give everyone a chance to talk. But obviously that doesn't always work, even though it helps a lot. Um, I think that's, again, where the role of the facilitator comes in to where if someone is like dominating the conversation, the facilitator needs to step in. Um, I think Kaz from Made By Us is a great example of what a neutral facilitator looks like. Um, you know, she would say, haven't heard from, you know, this person or that person. Um, do you want to jump in? And she was very neutral. Um, and, and I think that's what the, um, the facilitator in this conversation series should emulate as well. Um, but my pushback against time constraints is that it just, it feels too, like, restrictive. And it feels a lot like school as well. Like, again, like, in a normal conversation, um, if we're wanting people to model this in other places as much as possible, like there's not going to be time constraints. So we just want to teach people to have like realistic, healthy dialogues. I fully agree with Mad with what Madison just said. Um, if you like, I feel like a good question for us as we're like developing what this convert what the this dialogue series would look like is like, can you do this at school? Can you do this with your friends? Can you do this at home with your family? And like, if the answer is like reoccurringly no, then it's not gonna fulfill the objective of like creating skill sets that are relevant and having political discourse outside of CU or just like having healthy political discourse at all anywhere. Hmm. It's a weird point. Like uh, outside of, I mean, I think CU should be where you train up your civic muscles to, so that when you're in the real world, you don't need a facilitator because you are you're not um you're not you're just, well you're just not going to have that <laughs> uh, in the real world so like, you're going to want to act in a way that doesn't you know take up all the air or and similarly you're going to want to be able to call it out when someone is someone else is taking up all the oxygen as well for example Allison, I know that, sorry, I can't, I, I can't, I don't see the people, so I can't see who is about to talk, but go ahead. I heard my name, Madison yeah. called on me. I was about to say, Allison, I know like you haven't had a chance to jump in, so wanted to um, let you jump in here. I mean, Where you can have this kind of conversation is definitely a hard thing to dictate because the thing is, I 
I'm going to be blunt. I hate participating in pretty much political conversation of almost any kind, because the thing is, in my opinion, politics thrives off the two things I hate the most, conflict and controversy. And I don't like the fact that social issues have become so political nowadays, but that's a completely different topic entirely. In terms of the subject of like the facilitator and how this discussion goes, I feel like it should just be as open as possible, people jump in, but it should be somewhat regulated in the sense that we're not attacking each other with our points. We're more or less saying, from our perspective, this is what happened and this is how we want to get past it. Yeah, and I think that's definitely where the facilitator comes in. It's just like making sure the conversation is healthy. And I love what Gary said about training up so that you don't need a facilitator um, in other spaces. So I'm, I think, I think that um, while everyone's here, and I don't know if we have the time for this, or if there's like, this is a conversation that needs to happen separately, but we do need to set the boundaries for like what is debatable. Um, Allison brought up a really great point about the fact that like a lot of social issues are considered to be political issues. And at the end of like, there are things that you can't even like entertain as conversations or debatable because that implies so much. Um, so what do those boundaries look like um, for our community? Because I also think that that's like part of the facilitators or enforcing preordained boundaries rather than coming up with them on the spot. So you just made me think of another thing. Um, uh, another design choice is like setting a clear topic and objective before every conversation. So the facilitator even knows what they need to work off of. Uh, Madison, one thing I wanna uh, kind of ask is like, do we agree that the general objective is to find common ground and better understand the topics we're debating because like yeah. i just realized we haven't really necessarily hit on that ex exactly because i understand there's going to be a goal a specific goal within every separate um installment of this series um but i so we can all agree that the general goal is to find common ground and better understand the subject right you're right that doesn't make sense to set an objective because obviously the general that I can, or is that a different yeah um, and I would, uh, common ground, even common ground is like, I, I even common ground is a nice to have relative to just understanding what the other person is thinking. That was like a, that was like, I have a friend who's like, just does this for a living and he's like, that's part of the huge part of the problem is that people think that these conversations are about persuasion um, or becoming like allies or whatever. Like, I don't know. I, I think that, that, that's definitely, that's definitely in the top two priority of common ground, but like, I don't think it needs to be guaranteed to have a, a useful conversation. Yeah, like I think something that will also need to like, Couple with is just not like not every conversation will end with a pretty resolution, um, and I think it's important to recognize that. So um, I think that like a good because I know we have like a closing process. The entire I feel like a big portion of the conversation would be like application. But there still needs to be almost like a self reflection or like ownership of learning moment that needs to happen. And so I think a good provocation would be something along the lines of like what's something new that you're taking into consideration that you weren't taking prior to this conversation. It's not like committing to someone else's opinion or perspective, but it is like forcing you outside the box of like where you originally started when when the conversation began. And I love that because it's not yeah. like it leaves room for you to still have developing thoughts too yeah and i might add that you know if the objective is let's say the objective is at least you know one of them is to understand what the other person's perspective to actually simply restate their perspective in a way that's satisfying to the other person 
you know. Okay, um, anything else before we close? I'm really proud of this like conflict resolution process that we've established for ourselves. Um, so I wanna say like, thank you to everyone par for participating or like whoever was responsible for even suggesting that this is the process we undergo. And I think that like, because the challenge like took shape in a very public way, it'd be great to like, put this in general and just like, this was a challenge that arise. This is how we resolved it. And like, this is the community members that like took lead on next action steps. Um, that way there's like mutual understanding. Cause I know we post these to YouTube, but like people not knowing that the information's even there or what it pertains to um, doesn't necessarily make it accessible. So I'd love for like the next, the next follow-up step to be posting in general with a message explaining like the context of the conversation, the outcomes, and then the recording itself. <laughs> Yeah, Madison, will you? Oh. Super quickly, do we want to post this one? Like, I like, I guess, like, I like, I'm just thinking, like, I don't know, I don't know. Um, I think I know where you're coming from, Ashley. At, at, at very least, we should have a very clear an, ex, an excited announcement of a new conflict resolution process in like a month once once we're ready to actually un un unroll it you know what i mean yeah yes i agree because <laughs> right now it's just in such a like i mean i just don't think it's a, it's the best use of people's time just watch i don't think many people will and uh, i think people would, would rather maybe attend the first one when they actually have it, or whenever whenever we're ready to invest people I don't necessarily think anyone will like watch the conversation in full, but I do think that like making the premise of that dialogue series like very clear and accessible, like there's no harm in just linking it. Yeah, oh, yeah. I think I, th I think the backstory is really important, and we we can kind of uh, we 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 don't need to be that specific with the incident, but just more broadly, like hey, we identified that we're like there were some heated debates and. Uh, people weren't seeing, you know, uh, weren't, I don't know, you, you know what I mean? Like th there was a status quo and then we, we, the community itself saw an opportunity to do something about it. Here's the process through which we developed it and um, get excited because we're rolling this out now. Uh, and then whatever we document, oh, it's going to be so impressive to, uh well, like our partners and our donors like this is this is actually this is really impressive this is already really impressive yeah i was gonna say it's so cool just for like transparency and learning in public sake like the fact that we went from like this conflict that was like super heated to within 30 minutes coming up with a solution that we want to experiment with is really cool and so i think that it's worth um this is like an all-time like cu highlight right here All right, um, anyone have anything else before we close? Thanks for participating, guys. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you all so much. This is really cool. Um, and I'm excited to see where this series goes. So thank you. Okay, have a good- All right. Peace. <laughs>